underneath that. That's what it looks like to me. Um, Mr. Smith is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all of our witnesses, uh, certainly for your unique perspectives, uh, but also expressing common concerns. And as uh, we, we sit here, uh, it's a very relevant place that uh, we would be here at a port as a representative from Nebraska, the number one agriculture district uh, in, the, in the U.S. House. Trade is important. Getting products out of our country to other markets is important, and to do so reliably. And uh, the reverse of that, too, we, we know it is important, whether it's fertilizer or other products, be it for agriculture specifically or our economy uh, in general. So we, we saw such difficulties during COVID uh, that, that further complicated uh, what was already a problem. Mr. At Atkins, can you outline for us what you believe were the specific choke points uh, here at GCT in moving goods during COVID and how you overcame them? And then if you have any insight in ways so we might be able to alleviate them in the future. Sure. Thank you, Representative Smith. Um, the, where we saw the cho choke points were the long dwell times of the imports that were coming off the ship. There were a few reasons that that was created. Number one was um, some warehouses just did not have enough space to bring the containers out and put the cargo into the warehouse because they were full. Their parking lots were full with other imported containers. So they tended to sit here and dwell at any of these facilities for a longer than average period of time. There was also an issue with lack of chassis. Those are the sets of wheels that detach from the container and actually move. Uh, where were all the chassis? They were tied up in the parking lots of uh, all the shippers with loads on them that they could not unload them and get the empties back in time uh, to return the empty and pick up the next one. So it was a chassis issue, it was a space constraint issue, and it really just backed up the pipeline into the ports and went beyond that to the point that for most of 2022, the Port of New York had on average about 15 to 17 ships at Anchorage waiting to come in, and they could not come in and discharge the goods because there were no room at the facilities. So. Now you see driving down here today, um, time has somewhat resolved that issue. You see not enough cargo coming in. There's plenty of space now. There's plenty of chassis that are available. So it was working down inventories that has helped that. And also the, the purchasing um, volume has just gone down over uh, the pandemic time period. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Romano, you've spoken about the uh vertical integration at Tronox and the importance of raw materials in Africa and Australia. Can you tell us about what you've seen regarding, or further uh, tell us what you've seen regarding the Chinese attempts to aggressively secure the raw material resources globally so that they can control and exploit those? Thank you for the question. Um, so yes, historically, you would have, so Australia, I mentioned we are a big miner in Australia, and you get a lot of junior miners in Australia that have historically not only mined, but they've upgraded that uh, raw material. What you're seeing now is a lot of these junior miners are getting interest from the Chinese. So they buy into these companies, get board seats, and in many instances, they're getting 100% right, offtake rights to the material. So I mentioned, uh, Mozambique, it's another good example, where they're running out of titanium in China in the minerals that they mine. So in Mozambique, they go in there, they buy the mining rights. They are taking the raw material in a form of what's, which is called heavy mineral concentrate. It's not upgraded. And then they ship everything back to, to China to be upgraded and processed. For us as a miner, you know, we have very strict rules on how we actually have to take the mining work that we do and then put the the property that we mine on back to its normal, the way it came, the natural flora and fauna. Um, you know, that's a significant disadvantage that we have, um, an advantage they have because of the unfair practice that they are using by going and exploiting other countries to get raw materials to send back to China. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hemminger, uh, just briefly, uh, in the interest of time, can you uh, perhaps reflect on the need for enforceable trade agreements? and maybe touching upon USMCA in addressing Canada's dairy uh, tariff rate quota system. 
It seems like uh, close the loophole seems to be the common theme here today, and that's certainly the case there, I think. Um, in uh, my attachment number three uh, with my testimony, um, the CEO of our uh, milk co-op, Upstate Niagara Co-op, uh, articulately explains uh, the issues. And it's, it's really confounding that for 30 years this has gone on. I have thought numerous times we would, this was going to be enforced in the next two or three years, but somehow they cleverly keeps figuring out a way to not live up to their side of the agreement. Well said. Thank you. I yield back. 